much, Perry. I also Thank you very much, Perry. I'd like to echo those words of thanks to the committee who put this on and made it possible for us to hold our symposium this year. So the title is Serendipity in the Discovery of British Columbia's First KPG Boundary Section, a Snapshot of Marine Phytoplankton Turnover and Paleoenvironmental Change in the North Pacific Realm. My supervisor at the University of Victoria has been Vera Pospilova, who's now with us from the University in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I'm going to start by introducing dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are single-celled protists, which is Latin for whirling whip because of the flagellum that encircles them. They're found in all oceans from the Triassic, some are freshwater, and some live in lakes, as well as the ocean. They are the largest, second largest phytoplankton group, the first largest being diatoms. They are auto, hetero, and mixotrophic. And most importantly for my work, they form a resting cyst stage or hypnozygote, also known as a dinocyst for short, comprised of a carbohydrate-based biopolymer called dinosporin. They are highly abundant. They can be found in just one gram of sediment with thousands of them. They're widely dispersed, easily and well-preserved, easily collected, you only need small samples, and many groups and species are ecologically, latitudinally, environmentally, and temporally constrained. Furthermore, dinocysts are tools for paleoenvironmental reconstructions and relative dating. In deep time studies, they provide insights into paleoecology, so the relation to other fossil assemblages, paleooceanography, ocean circulation patterns, paleobiogeography, spatial range and provincialism, extinction and succession, so temporal ranges and diachroneity, paleoproductivity, so nutrient input and upwelling indicators, as well as paleoclimate, so latitudinal temperature gradient indicators as well. This is a complex slide, but it's just to illustrate that dinocysts have preferential habitats. Some like to be more inner shelf, more coastal, estuarine, more tolerant of brackish waters, whereas others provide more of an offshore signal with potentially oceanic input and coastal upwelling from deeper waters. Motivations for this work are that Cretaceous early paleogene research is scarce in the North Pacific. We only had some work done in California and in Japan. Dinosaurs are, of course, indicators of responsivity to the KPG event if they're environmental indicators. And the North Pacific is the last vast geographic frontier for deep time marine pale palynology, especially for the KPG boundary interval. So we're all probably familiar with the end of the Cretaceous mass extinction at approximately 66 million years ago that wiped out a large portion of the fauna and flora. So we had a bolide impact coinciding with decan volcanism and those major flora and fauna extinctions, global warming of approximately five degrees over the 100,000 years ensuing and some short-term cooling, as well as primary productivity recovering over that half a million years later. That's a snapshot of the KPG boundary at the global stratotype section and point in El Kefa, Tunisia, showing that classic uh, boundary clay layer. For these, this research objectives, we had classification and taxonomy, which gave us the opportunity to survey and describe the taxa present and ID the index species, relative dating, constructing the biostratigraphy across the KPG boundary. And for paleoenvironmental reconstruction, we could assess the depositional setting, the primary productivity, the paleoenvironmental reconstructions locally and abroad, as well as phytoplankton paleoecology and changes across the KPG boundary and to correlate the North Pacific intervals with other regions and to synthesize these findings with the global data set. So our region here on Vancouver Island and then just south of the Campbell River is the area of excitement. That is the Oyster Bay formation yet to be formally described, which is unconformably overlying the Nanaimo group strata. Here's a strat column of the full Nanaimo group, and there would, we would be right above that with the oyster Bay strata. And it's broken into three principal outcrops. A there is classic Appian Way, B just to the north, 
is what's been deemed the Linwood section, and C to the south is a small outcrop along the Oyster River. And this is a bit of a uh, schematic diagram, aerial view of these locations and their outcrops. Uh, Appian Way along the coast, B, the Linwood, and C, Oyster River, with all those red dots indicating sites of matrix sampled for this study. So standing in the Linwood, looking to the northeast, we have some massive sandstones and alternating mudstones. The Appian Way there, a little quick video, looking from the southeast, we're panning to the north uh, west, looking up toward the Linwood locality there. Shows you those alternating beds of finer and coarse grain strata. And standing on the syncline axis there at Appian Way, looking to the southeast and panning up to the northwest. And then on the Oyster River, a small outcrop of just a few meters, but nevertheless, the same strata, sandstones, and mudstones. So the serendipity aspect of this study on this slide has to do with the basal Linwood. So in the pilot part of this study, I went to the Linwood locality, took three samples, one at the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. And the one at the bottom came out of this notch in the rock right about there, if you can see my pseudo laser pointer. Right about in there, we got this little depression. It wasn't quite a concretion, but it was semi-consolidated. So I thought, okay, there's a candidate for a sample. And then lo and behold, it was absolutely loaded with Palmodinium gralliter, which is a species that is perhaps the greatest indicator for the upper Maastrichtian in the Northern hemisphere uh, in terms of palynological assemblages. And it wasn't just that it was Palmodinium gralliter present, it was the palladinium growler acme, which was constrained in the section to about uh, 10 centimeters. And given the thickness of the whole section, which was uh, uh, the Linwood section, which was about 48 meters, I figured that the probability of me sampling that one on the first whack was about one in 650,000. <laughs> so there you go. I, it, it was uh, enough to really give you a kind of kick in the pants to, to get going and get excited about this project, given that there's definitively Cretaceous material. Well, the boundaries that has to be there somewhere and it certainly was. So the matrix was sampled in baggies and then brought to the lab, digested with hydrochloric acid and then hydrofluoric acid to remove the carbonates and then the um, siliceous materials to give us the final organics that we then turned into smear slides after introducing lycopodium spores, which were the uh, modern moss spore used as an American control so that we could then determine absolute and relative abundances for inferences um, based on ratios. And there's a, a smear slide, for example, it was made from material that was sieved above 50 microns, but below 120 for a light transmitted microscopy and also epifluorescence microscopy, which you see there, the illumination of specimens revealing to us a proxy for autotrophic capabilities meaning that these guys made their own food and didn't just hunt if they illuminated. So two key index taxa here, of course, to the right, Palinidium gralliter, as mentioned, for the upper Maastrichtian, and then Dania californica for the basal Danian up section. So this is an example of the diversity that we have here. These are heterotrophic dinoflagellates with a classic kind of, uh, what's it called a peridineoid uh, morphology with their angular horns. And then we can see that some of these varieties also illuminate, telling us that they were, had mixotrophic capability and that they weren't just hunters. Some more diversity here showcased by a whole myriad of different forms, different fibrous processes and the like. They all have what's called a characteristic uh, opening known as an archipile, which I'm sure you'll notice on some of these, that's where the cell hatched out and went about its life. Let me get that. There we are. So we've got a little openings there, openings there, openings there, and so forth. Laser pointer working there. 
And then some have more elaborate structures where they're all very um, spinous, very branching, very intricate for different means to, to for the, enable their suspension in the water column for a longer period of time. Because if you sink and you hatch out, you have a lot longer of a distance to swim back up to your favorite position in the water column. This uh, slide summarizes pretty much everything in terms of the assemblages that were recovered. We have the three uh, sections on the left there, uh, Linwood, Appian Way, and the Oyster River. And these signals or these patterns are the different groups of dinoflagellates and terrestrial spores and pollen indicating the turnover event that happened there post-Cretaceous. So we have an expanded KPG boundary interval that is essentially at the uppermost part of the, the Linwood section where we have a major turnover in the assemblages moving from a more offshore signal to a more inshore signal with influences from terrigenous outflow and brackish waters. This is an exploded view of the bottom of the Linwood just to show you there that in the yellow that is this spike of the palladium growler as they peaked right at the late Maastrichtian. So uh, since the synthesis of the overall global data set was performed as part of this study as well. So all the world's literature, uh, 676 reports collected from 435 published studies show us that 87% of the reports of the 10 key index species in the Oyster Bay formation are constrained within 6 million years crossing the KPG boundary. And these are some of those selected taxa plotted their positions all across the world in relation to where we are up there with that little star for, and then also for some of the uh, more predominantly heterotrophic or paradinioid dinoflagellates. Now also there aren't only dinoflagellates of course in the palynological assemblage, there are a myriad of other things we have pyrotized endocasts of silica flagellates and diatoms on the upper right there, scolecodonts in the top, the CDE, which are the mouth parts of marine polychaete worms, acrotarchs and sporomorphs, palomorphs of, of all different affinities, as well as the internal um, organic linings of foraminifers, so K and L down there in the bottom left. Uh, but most of all, the second greatest diversity is, of course, with the terrestrial spores and pollen, which would be the next jumping off point for future research. So the highlights of this study are that the Oyster Bay formation revealed the first KPG boundary interval west of the Rockies based on biostratigraphic controls and potentially the oldest Paleogene section in coastal BC. And the Appian Way is a definitively Danian. BC fossil or uh, dinocysts record the uh, phytoplankton and paleoecological turnover across the KPG boundary, which is consistent with other coeval deposits across both hemispheres. And the microfossil assemblages record signals of coastal to estuarine paleoenvironmental fluctuation over four and a half to five million years. And also, what greater uh, reinforcing piece of evidence for terrestrial input? than the incredible plethora of plants that have been described by Ruth Stocky and her group over the last 20 years. Dinocysts also provide signals that indicate periods of localized elevated primary productivity likely owing to upwelling of nutrient waters and that terrigenous outflow, as well as convergence of boreal and subtropical taxa, indicating depositional settings that are probable with their paleo latitude near the present location and the diocese tax of West African affinity suggests that warming surface waters into the earliest Danian carried from an east-west transatlantic current those diocists over to our west coast and then up north the west coast of North America. I'd like to thank everyone who made this possible. So much of this was possible only because of the efforts of other people lending their skills, time, and expertise. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have.